In 1895, the Viennese newspaper, Neue Freie Presse, assigned its Paris correspondent, Theodor Herzl, to report on the degradation of Captain Alfred Dreyfus. Dreyfus, a Frenchman of the Jewish faith, had been falsely convicted of spying for the Germans. He was framed only because he was a Jew. Anti-Semites, as usual, exploited the trial of an individual to incite against an entire people. Mob cries of death to the Jews filled Herzl's heart with horror. In the wake of the Dreyfus trial, Herzl wrote a small book entitled The Jewish State. In this publication, he maintained that anti-Semitism stemmed from the fact that the Jews were a people without a land, an alien and defenseless minority wherever they resided. In many countries, they were unwanted guests. The publication of this book, which 45 years before the Holocaust called for the creation of a homeland for the Jewish people, sparked a chain of events that would eventually lead to the re-establishment of the State of Israel. Jerusalem was already the capital of Israel 3,000 years ago. It was the city of King David, Isaiah the prophet, Judas Maccabeus, and Herod the Great. It was here that Jesus, whom the Romans called King of the Jews, was tried and crucified. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, changing the name of the country from Judea to Palestina. Nevertheless, they did not succeed in severing the Jewish connection to that land. The slogan, next year in Jerusalem, united all wandering, dispersed, persecuted Jews throughout the ages. Zion is the poetic name for Jerusalem. Yearning and hope for the return to Zion were the secret of the Jews' survival. Jews always returned to Jerusalem. They could be seen at the Wailing Wall, clinging to its ancient hallowed stones, remnants of Jerusalem's former grandeur. They did not need Herzl to tell them that this was the Jewish state, their promised land. Every page of the Bible bore witness to it. Three times a day, they prayed to God Almighty to perform a miracle and return the Jews to Zion. When Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress in 1897, he was not introducing a new idea. He just altered the method, calling for re-establishment of a Jewish state not through divine power, as pious Jews had maintained, but rather through political action. Palestine was then part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, rejected Herzl's request that it be turned over to the Jews. Herzl's well-known attempt to enlist the support of the German Kaiser, an ally of the Sultan, also proved to be in vain. In his distress, Herzl turned to Great Britain. England, the mighty and the free. England, who rules the seven seas, she will surely understand us and our aspirations. So said Herzl, as he transferred his political activity to London. This was during the early years of the reign of Edward VII. In Britain, the age-old idea of the restoration of Israel was much in favor. However, despite all its goodwill, His Majesty's government was incapable of returning the land of Israel to the Jews, as this land was simply not in its possession. This is Kishinev, the city that put on the world's agenda the plight of eight million Jews in Tsarist Russia. Here was the scene, the first and most notorious pogrom of the 20th century. 
I remember that at dusk, groups of young people gathered in the street opposite our house. For some reason, Papa went from window to window and looked outside. After I was put to bed by our nanny, they threw a stone. I heard windows breaking. I asked Nanny what it was, but she just said, lie down. Lie down and be quiet. Don't leave your room, and so on. All the windows in our large room were shattered. The pogrom, which started with the shattering of windows, developed into an all-out attack on homes and shops. Towards evening, a massacre began. Marauders threw children out of upper-story windows, gouged out their victims' eyes, and drove nails into their heads. For two days, the police did not intervene, halting the slaughter only on the third day, when the number of deaths had reached 49. Herzl, deeply upset by the pogroms, then convened the sixth Zionist Congress in Basel. There were opening speeches, just as always. There was great tension. We felt that there was something extraordinary in the air. Suddenly, Herzl rose and declared, I have a great surprise for you. His Majesty, the King of the British Empire, His Majesty, the King of the British Empire, sends you a gift. The gift is Uganda. When he returned to his seat, there was unbelievable tension in the hall. Total silence. Not a single voice was heard. Suddenly, it was as if the entire hall was stirred to life. Some people began shouting, we don't want it, we don't want it, while others screamed, yes, we do. It was a great scandal. The British government's generous offer to establish a Jewish homeland in Africa put the Zionist movement to its most serious test. Many supported Herzl, but others resisted explaining that the Jewish people could not build a national home anywhere but in its own beloved land. Herzl was especially perplexed by the reaction of the delegates from Kishinev. Even they, the Jews of the city of slaughter, rejected the Uganda plan. He didn't understand what happened. He didn't understand at all. He just couldn't grasp how such an unfortunate nation, suffering pogroms and denied all rights and privileges, could be offered a country and say no. The Russian Zionists began to explain, we don't want just any country. We are Zionists. We want to return to our ancestral homeland. During the Congress, Herzl was photographed with a group of Russian Zionists. This is the only picture in which we see Herzl together with the rising star of the Zionist movement, Dr. Chaim Weizmann. If the British nation is what I think it is, it will eventually offer us a better proposition, said the man who, 14 years later, was to receive the Balfour Declaration. Herzl died ten months later. Some say he died of a broken heart. 
Tens of thousands attended his funeral. Herzl was mourned deeply throughout the Jewish world. In the eyes of the oppressed, persecuted masses, he symbolized some hope that the situation could be improved. Without him, it seemed as if the Zionist movement had come to its end. However, ongoing events prevented the disappearance of Zionism. In 1905, revolution broke out in Russia. Tsar Nicholas II ordered the revolt to be crushed ruthlessly. As he dispatched his Cossack troops against the revolutionaries, he resorted to the age-old ugly trick of diverting social resentment toward the Jews the classic scapegoats of all crises. Within a single week in October 1905, more than 50 pogroms, all government-inspired, took place in Tsarist Russia. <laughs> Jewish flight from Russia attained the dimensions of an entire national migration. The vast majority emigrated to Western countries, primarily the United States. Only a few chose Palestine. Palestine was never an attractive country for immigration. It could offer only a life of poverty, a difficult climate and fatal diseases. It was last on the colonialists' list of desirable countries. Only deep spiritual motivation could bring civilized people to Palestine. I crossed the Jezreel Valley on a narrow path through a haze of swarming mosquitoes. I finally reached Kinneret, the wasteland which we began to restore. The land was dead. You had to have deep conviction to attempt to revitalize such soil. Great enthusiasm marked the early years of Zionism in the land of Israel. The founding fathers believed that assimilation in the diaspora was to bring about the extinction of the Jewish people. Only here, in their historic surroundings, would the Jewish people have an opportunity for rejuvenation. Eliezer ben Yehuda, a founding father of the Zionist movement, argued that return to Zion alone was not sufficient to rescue Judaism from assimilation and extinction. Something else was required, a return to the Hebrew language. In Jerusalem, Ben Yehuda conducted an astonishing experiment. He raised the first children in 2,000 years whose mother tongue was Hebrew. They didn't let us play with other children. We were under kind of house arrest. We were not allowed to go out into the street and speak to strange children. And what happened when, say, my oldest brother reached the age of four, five or six and had no friends? My parents brought home a dog and a cat, a male dog and a female cat. My brother could speak to the dog in the masculine and to the cat in the feminine. And so he learned to use gender in speaking with others. These were the first friends and also the first animals to speak Hebrew for some 2,000 years. The revival of the Hebrew language, a historical wonder unprecedented in the annals of mankind, was by no means a simple matter. Street demonstrations like those photographed in Jerusalem in 1911 were needed to institute Hebrew as the language of study in schools. Administrators of Jewish schools claimed that it was impossible to teach arithmetic and geometry in the holy tongue. But the demonstrators, zealots for the Hebrew language, contended that it was indeed possible and that there was no choice. Otherwise, the Jewish nation would not survive. What were the Arabs of Palestine thinking as they saw the Jews waving their blue and white flags? What was this land to them? Islam came to the Holy Land in the 7th century. 
tribes of fearless warriors burst forth from the Arabian desert and in a series of startling conquests took over vast territories extending from India to Spain. For several centuries, as Christian Europe groped through the darkness of the Middle Ages, the Arabs were the standard bearers of progress and culture. The natural sciences, philosophy and fine arts all flourished under their rule. The sanctity of Jerusalem captured the hearts of the Muslims. Some 1400 years ago, they erected a splendid mosque on the very site of the ancient Jewish temple raised by the Romans, thus rendering Jerusalem the third most important holy city in Islam after Mecca and Medina. Since the time of the Muslim conquest, Arabs had constituted the majority of the inhabitants of Palestine. But throughout Arab history, Palestine had never been a political unit. It was part of the Arab-speaking world extending from the Atlantic to the Indian Oceans. When the Jews began their large-scale return to Zion in the 19th century, the Arabs were politically dormant. No organized resistance arose during the first 38 years of Zionist settlement in Palestine. Very few Arabs had indeed warned of the Zionist peril. They could rely on the anti-Zionist Turkish regime to thwart all Jewish aspirations. The outbreak of World War I in August 1914 was to change the picture dramatically. Great War, four years of awesome catastrophe unparalleled in history, brought the world of yesterday to an end. The Turkish Empire chose to align itself with the wrong side. The royal visit of the German Kaiser to the Sultan in Istanbul was a high point of this unfortunate alliance. The Sultan, indeed, declared a jihad, a holy war against the British and the French, not realizing that by doing so he had sealed the fate of his empire. The British response was quite spectacular. At the end of 1916, after an abortive Turkish attack on the Suez Canal, a massive expeditionary force was sent from Egypt to Palestine. Crossing the Sinai Desert was almost an impossible mission. The Australian and New Zealand Mounted Division successfully led the troops in this costly but amazing operation, proceeding slowly to enable construction of a railway line. The plan was to capture Gaza, the historic southern gateway of Palestine. The attack failed. British forces were repulsed, suffering heavy losses and entrenching themselves behind their desert lines.
One result of this defeat was the appointment of a new commander, General Edmund Henry Allenby, a cavalry officer who had excelled on the French front. Allenby attempted to breathe new life into his battered army, exploiting the three summer months for planning his offensive. Towards the end of October 1917, Allenby opened heavy artillery fire in the direction of Gaza. This was only a diversionary tactic during which the main force stormed Beersheba and took it by surprise. As the Imperial Camel Corps entered this Negev desert city, the battle for Palestine was essentially determined. The British broke through the front lines and began advancing northward, meeting virtually no resistance. The march through Gaza and Ashkelon, across the fields of Philistia towards Lydda and Jaffa, destination Jerusalem, aroused emotion and imagination. This was no ordinary battlefront. Every hill, every dry stream and every clump of earth was laden with historic memories. The miserable villages all bore names of well-known biblical cities. On November the 2nd, 1917, two days after the conquest of Beersheba, the Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, wrote what he called a declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations. This was to become a most crucial document in the history of Palestine. The key sentence was, His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. News of the Balfour Declaration found the British forces advancing northward. By November 15th, Jaffa had fallen and the troops turned eastward toward the Judean mountains. The attack came most severely on Saturday, but by Saturday night, all was quiet. We managed to see the Turkish soldiers, whose retreat, incidentally, was remarkable. The Turkish soldiers didn't riot at all. As they retreated, all they asked for was ekmek, bread. The outfit that was nearest Jerusalem at that particular time was the 50th London Division, made up of Cockneys, very largely. And they had gotten ahead of their lines of supplies, and they were short of food. And one officer, an old friend of mine, Major Vivian Gilbert, had a cook and a sergeant who were awfully good at foraging. And he got out a map and showed them where he thought there was a village a couple of miles away, and he uh, told them to try and find the village and see if they could get any food. As the mayor of Jerusalem, Hussein Salim el Husseini, was leaving the city, waving a white flag, he met two British sergeants who had strayed. What were they really looking for? There are several versions to this story. Menashe Eliasha, as a small boy, had accompanied the delegation of surrender. They were informed that a surrender was taking place, in which the keys of the city were to be handed over to the conquering army. But the first thing they asked for was matches. This scene remains in my memory to this day. For ten days they had cigarettes, but for ten days they had no matches and no way of smoking. To see these two soldiers ignoring the events around them, just to see them smoking, is something I'm unable to forget. He was a Muslim. He was the Muslim mayor, and he was coming out to surrender Jerusalem to Allenby's army. And the first representatives of Allenby's army that he met were the company cook and the sergeant. <laughs> and he turned the keys of uh, Jerusalem, or his surrender, actually, over to the cook. And the cook said, I don't want any keys to any holy city. What I want is Higgs for my officer. On December 9th, 1917, British army columns advanced on all roads leading to the Holy City. The victorious General Allenby rode up to the Jaffa Gate on horseback.
כשהוא נכנס ופתחו את השער הגדול They opened the great gate for him, which was always closed, but on that day, it was wide open. When I saw him, I thought perhaps it was the Messiah, so respectable, so upright and handsome. People cheered and applauded. We knew that redemption had come, how we yearned to be redeemed. Allenby and his soldiers entered the old city on foot. History recorded that they entered as pilgrims rather than conquerors. Many elders, distinguished notables of the city of Jerusalem were present. Shall I recall their names? There was Musa Kazem Pasha, Saeed Efendi al Husseini. Muhammad al-Alami, of course, many people. Alambi addressed them. We have conquered the entire city. What have you got to say? They said in Arabic, welcome. After the conquest of Jerusalem, the British troops needed a long rest. When this ruddy war is over, <laughs> oh, how happy I shall be. When this ruddy Allenby had to postpone continuing the conquest of Palestine and Syria by nine months because of the worsening situation on the French front. The Jerusalem landscape has seen quite a bit of history. Here lay the well-known battlefields of the judges, kings, Maccabees, zealots, and other heroes. Along these roads marched the soldiers of Assyria and Babylonia, Greek armies and Roman legions. These hills of Judea had witnessed the rise and fall of the Byzantines, Persians, Crusaders, and Mamelukes. Now, as the last Turkish march was played, a new sound rang out, one never heard before in the land of the Bible. The British avoided offensive campaigns but kept up continuous action along the front line which divided Palestine at the mountains of Samaria, north of Jerusalem. Australian Air Force reconnaissance flights in 1918 provide us with the first aerial films of Jerusalem. A remarkable event was then taking place in Aqaba, on the shores of the Red Sea. Here was the camp of Emir Faisal son of the Hashemite Hussein, Sharif of Mecca. From here, the Bedouin fighters raided Turkish positions in Transjordan in a series of operations known in history as the Revolt in the Desert. Every day, uh, Arab from the, Bed from the desert used to come there to to say that we are with you, with, with Faisal, with uh, Faisal King too. Uh, we are ready to fight with you. They used to come every day. The railway, Hezaz railway, very many stations, the army, in every station there was an army. They used to take the Arabs to fight that army, to break that uh, soldiers, uh, to make war on them, slowly, slowly. The living spirit and virtual commander of these raids was a young British archaeologist, Thomas Edward Lawrence who would later attain international renown as Lawrence of Arabia. Tales of the revolt in the desert would spread throughout Europe and America like a modern version of the Arabian Nights. The Hashemite family was the only Arab body which cooperated with Britain in the First World War. 
In return, they sought to re-establish a pan-Arab kingdom throughout the Middle East. Britain dispatched a letter of support, explicitly excluding Christian Lebanon from this kingdom. Reference to Palestine, however, was somewhat ambiguous. The Arabs would claim that it was granted to them, while the British would declare that no such promise was made. This dispute would never have erupted, however, were it not for that other British document, the Balfour Declaration, which promised Palestine to the Jews. June 1918, a British ship carrying supplies of gold and rifles to Emir Faisal also bore a distinguished passenger, Dr. Chaim Weizmann. The Zionist leader sought to reach an understanding with a man who then represented the Arab liberation movement. The desert meeting between the two leaders would subsequently lead to the signing of the Weizmann Faisal Agreement on the Palestine question. Weizmann would never forget the drama of his experience with Faisal. In later years, whenever the relations between Jews and Arabs became tense and violent, he would say, yes, but back in 1918, if it was possible, for a Zionist leader and the greatest of Arab leaders to meet together and to reach an agreement. Perhaps what happened once could happen again. Another of his impressions was the apathy of Faisal about Palestine. Uh, Faisal was dramatically concerned with Damascus and with uh, Baghdad, the great historic capitals, but this little squalid corner that he called Palestine, he attached very little importance to it. On September 19, 1918, the war in Palestine flared up. Hundreds of cannons opened a barrage of hellfire on Turkish positions. The main force then broke through the Jezreel Valley at the historic pass of Megiddo, climbing the Nazareth Hills and proceeding through the Golan Heights towards Damascus. At the same time, a task force was sent to occupy Transjordan. It included the Jewish Legion, comprising volunteers from Britain and from the United States who came to fight, as Jews, in the battle for liberation of the promised land. The Jewish Legion was the first to cross the Jordan River, fighting on the same side as the Arabs, but for different political reasons. The immediate Turkish surrender in Transjordan opened the road northward to Syria. This was the finest hour for the Arabs. Faisal and Lawrence rushed to Damascus. Allenby ordered the rest of his troops to halt at the outskirts of the city, allowing the Arabs the privilege of entering Damascus first. Damascus, historic capital of Syria and cradle of modern Arab nationalism, welcomed Faisal enthusiastically. Cries of long live Faisal and long live Lawrence, that is Lawrence, could be heard everywhere. People were happy. Men and women gathered on the rooftops. Faisal passed through the Al Hamadiyya marketplace from which the road leads to the Umayyad Mosque. People were pleased, hoping that they would be granted an Arab state, as they were promised before the war broke out. A state to be ruled by Faisal. News of the establishment of military rule in Damascus, headed by Emir Faisal, made a great impression on the Arabs of Palestine. Suddenly realizing that Syria was about to achieve independence while Palestine was promised to the Jews by the Balfour Declaration, the Arabs awakened and began political activity. They declared that Palestine was an inseparable part of Syria. From then on, they referred to the land as southern Syria, rather than Palestine. The Arab national feeling in Palestine was part of the Arab national feeling in the rest of the Arab area, the Arab Middle East. Yes, Palestine was uh, part of the Asham, or the Asham meaning, you know, the whole of Syria, uh, northern, southern Syria, and so on. Uh, we, you know, this division between Palestine, Syria, Transjordan, Lebanon, and so on, was, uh, was in, came about because uh, France and Britain and Russia at one time, before 
the Bolshevik resolution, wanted to have spheres of influence. And, but to us, we, were, we, we, we at least thought that we were a part of one people and one country, and this is how we wanted it to be. In November 1918, Germany surrendered to the Allies. The First World War came to an end. Millions received the news with outbursts of joy. now shifted to Paris. The French capital was privileged to host the peace conference. The eyes of the entire world were turned towards this city which was celebrating victory. The atmosphere was saturated with great hope. The three most important personalities at the peace conference were the leaders of the free democratic world. The British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. The 80-year-old Prime Minister of France, Georges Clemenceau. And the person who was firmly resolved to ensure the right of self-determination for all nations, the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. The news spread rapidly. Delegations came to Paris from all over the world demanding the right of self-determination for their own nations as well. In January 1919, Paris looked like an international carnival of freedom seekers. Among others, one could meet the main characters of the Palestinian drama. The Jewish Liberation Movement delegation, led by Dr. Chaim Weizmann, and that of the Arab Liberation Movement, headed by Emir Faisal. Faisal's appearance in Paris created a sensation. His regal bearing, the aura of the revolt in the desert, and the participation of the legendary Lawrence himself in his delegation all made a great impression on the media. To improve his political standing, Faisal conferred with Weizmann and signed an agreement of cooperation with him, relinquishing his claim to Palestine and consenting that it be granted to the Jews. Faisal did not sign this document wholeheartedly, at the last minute, he added a certain reservation in his own handwriting, namely, on condition that the Arabs gain their independence, else I will not consider myself bound by a single word of this agreement. I had an extraordinary experience at the peace conference in connection with the Palestine mandate. I was there as the head of the Foreign Office League of Nations section, and it so happened that the head of the Foreign Office section who was dealing with the Palestine mandate, working very closely with Dr. Weizmann, very devoted to the Zionist cause, was a certain Eric Forbes Adams. And so every day in Paris, in the delegation offices, we used to argue this matter. And day after day, I said to America, it's no good. I just I don't believe it can work. I don't believe you can take a lot of people into somebody else's country without creating troubles of every possible description. And Eric Fox Atom got very exhausted, very tired of listening to me saying this uh, rigmarole, which I constantly repeated. And he said, will you fix a date to lunch with me some time off so that I can make arrangements that I want to make. Friday week. So I said, all right, Friday week. And when I got to the lunch on Friday week, who were his other guests but Lawrence of Arabia and the Emir of Faisal? And I was converted to Zionism by those two men, Faisal making speeches and Lawrence of Arabia translating from the Arabic. And the Emir Faisal said to me, of course we want Zionists to come into Palestine. We know what will happen. They'll bring vast sums of American and other capital from abroad. They'll bring in the greatest scientists in the world, all the greatest scientists are Jewish. And the territory of Palestine 
now so arid and so much of it a desert will be transformed, will be transformed. It will become a garden. It will blossom like the rose. We shall borrow their experts. We shall work together. We shall do the same in all the countries which we Arabs have turned into deserts. We shall make them flourish again, as they used to in the past. And so the Zionist delegation, headed by Chaim Weizmann, Nachum Sokolov, and Menachem Sishkin, appeared at the peace conference with no Arab opposition. In his address, Rosishkin claimed that the Jews too are entitled to self-determination. The land of Israel, he said, was forcibly usurped from the Jewish people, who were exiled and dispersed throughout the world. And now I, the descendant of those exiles, come before you and demand that our stolen historic homeland be returned to us. The agreement between Faisal and Weizmann was never put to the test. When the peace conference adjourned, the British made it clear that they were unable to keep their promises to the Arabs because of the strong objection of France, which claimed for itself the mandate over Syria and Lebanon. Faisal returned to Damascus empty-handed. When the news came that the French intended to expel Faisal from Syria, as he was too pro-British for their tastes, his Syrian and Palestinian supporters decided to launch a struggle. Excitement ran high in Jerusalem as well. In 1920, as the Nebi Musa festival procession left the Temple Mount, cries of long live King Faisal and death to the Jews could be heard. Suddenly the Arabs began to attack the Jews. I'll always remember. It happened on Passover, the festival of Nebi Musa. This was always an enjoyable experience for both tourists and our own families. Their songs, enthusiasm, swords, but swords raised in joy. I never heard of anyone being wounded. Then on that Sunday, suddenly, they began to run, brandishing their swords, pointing with their fingers. That hotel is full of Zionists. Zionists have come. They'll take Jerusalem away from us. Aleum. Let's get them. Let's kill them. By the time they reached us, they had already killed a few. I didn't know then what death was. I thought they threw a few stones and that was that. But those that were hit never got up. The Nebi Musa riots of 1920 were the first violent Arab attack on Zionism. Seven Jews were killed and 200 wounded. The world cared little about events in Damascus and Jerusalem. Three weeks later, the Allies convened a conference in the city of San Remo on the Italian Riviera. Here, representatives of the great powers were to sign an agreement for partition of the Middle East. France received the mandate for all Syria and Lebanon and immediately expelled the pro-British Faisal from Damascus. Britain was granted mandates over Iraq and Palestine, compensating Faisal for his expulsion from Syria by crowning him king of Iraq. Palestine, which then extended over both sides of the Jordan River, was set aside as a national home for the Jews. I think it was the first overt uh, step of, at that time, uh, uh, you know, putting an end to Arab dreams of unity with Damascus as the capital, reviving the, the glory of the, of, the, of the Umayyads and so on. Yes, I think it was a very, a very, very crucial event. Perhaps from then on it became not a political problem, but political problems with uh, particular problems in each sector of the Arab world. It was the beginning of fragmentation, if you want. Arab leaders in Palestine were shocked by these developments. All their hopes of becoming part of an independent pan-Arab kingdom were shattered in one blow. In their sorrow, they appealed to Musa Qasim al-Husseini, a Jerusalem notable and former mayor, 
choosing him as their leader. Now, said Musa Kazim, after the recent events in Damascus, we must change our plans here. Southern Syria no longer exists. It is Palestine that we must defend. July the 1st, 1920, the battleship Centaur anchored at the port of Jaffa. The first High Commissioner for Palestine, Sir Herbert Samuel, disembarked wearing a white uniform with a sword at his waist. This marked the beginning of the British Mandate era in the history of Palestine. This was the Zionist movement's finest hour. The British government supported Jewish aspirations of re-establishing a homeland in Palestine. To ensure the success of this plan, Britain had appointed Sir Herbert Samuel, a Jew and a Zionist, to govern the land. My breath even today stops when I think of how that scene looked. Every window and in a narrow street and little protruding windows from both sides of the street, full of Jews looking and crying and shouting and weeping with joy. Carpets on the, on the roadway, flowers everywhere, flags at every point. On the Sabbath following the fast of the 9th of Ab, commemorating the ancient destruction of Jerusalem. The High Commissioner walked through the old city on his way to synagogue. People felt that the days of the Messiah had come. And we walked along into the Chulva synagogue, which was crowded left as Makom. Not a seat could be obtained. So when the call came forth, Yamud Hanatsiv Elion, Herbert Samuel, rose and the whole congregation rose with him and he went upon the al Memar, and he started reciting the Barachot Lifnei Kriyat HaMaftir and he certainly recited them very well and I take some credit for that and then he came to the famous words Nachamu Nachami Nachamu Nachamu Ami Amar Lehechem at that point the congregation, as it were, shuddered, vibrated, quivered, and from the whole congregation, the rose, I could feel it, the rose, a great sigh, a bat call to the high heavens, the dome of the Churva, and in that moment, in that golden moment, the Jews inside that synagogue and all who knew of it outside felt that the hour of redemption had come.